everyone. This is National Master Dennis Montecrucis, and tonight I am bringing you the uh, 16th place finishing game from the 2007 U.S. Chess, uh, US Chess League Game of the Year countdown. So uh, in this game, the opponents are Julio Becerra, who's playing for Miami, and Ron Burnett from the Tennessee team. Julio Becerra is a grandmaster. He's from Cuba. I think he came to this country in 1999, and um, I believe he's probably a citizen by now, but in any case, he's been, been playing here for, for quite some time and um, played in, in the U.S. Championship, so uh, he's a regular now. Uh, Ron Burnett is around 40 years of age or so. He's an international master from Tennessee, and actually I've seen him, I think, for, I don't know, better than 20 years, so he, he uh, was a junior around the same time I was, so I've been familiar with this play for a long time. Anyway, here we go. Becerra had white. And here's how it went. So e4, oops, e4, g6. So at this point, Burnett is, is threatening the modern, but as we'll see, it'll turn into a Pierce momentarily. So d4, d6, knight c3. Uh, this allows black to get back into the Pierce. So if you want to punish black for this move order, what you have to do is play c4 on move 3. And here, black can still play it as a modern, but I would say probably the, the better way to play it, at least according to, uh, to Tiger Hillert person in his book on the modern, is to just go into the King's Indian. So you, you can continue to play this as a modern, but if you play the King's Indian, you're fine. That would be the, the best transposition. Anyway, all of this is purely theoretical, since Becerra played knight to c3, bishop g7, f4, knight f6, and now we're in the main line Austrian attack against the Peerts. So the Austrian attack is characterized by this move. So White's got this big pawn center and hopes, at least in, in theory, that he can simply uh, take this big space advantage and perhaps use it to, um, to give him enough central control while he builds up for a kingside attack. So often you'll see White continue with moves, at least if um, Black doesn't do anything too special. Play knight f3, bishop to d3, e5 castle, queen e1, queen h4. In blitz, it's it's quite easy to achieve this setup and to, to blast your opponents off the board. Of course, with players of this caliber, who are certainly very familiar, very familiar with the theory, this kind of thing isn't going to happen. But again, just in, in general, that's the sort of thing that White is up to. Sorry, I'm kind of fiddling with my, my headset here, so um, the sound should be fine here momentarily. I'm just trying to Get it so it's not either too far away or trying to um, trying to enter my uh, my mouth here. All right. So anyway, knight f6 goes back into the pierce as I said. Here, White's got um, a couple of moves. I mean, the main move overwhelmingly is knight f3, which is in fact what was played. But a3 is uh, an interesting move that's gaining some gaining popularity lately, with the idea that if Black continues with c5, which is the uh, the thematic way to, to proceed. D takes c5. Now queen a5 is, at least at first glance, refuted by b4. So that's the basic idea. The problem with this is that black can actually go into this, and it's not really clear that um, white is going to be all that happy. So queen of d8, and now there are various tricks involved with the long diagonal. So it's, a, it's just a very interesting position that, as I said, has become more popular recently. And, is just a new avenue that you might want to explore if you're interested in this position for either side. Okay, but in the game, white has played knight f3, old faithful here. Black played c5, this is the main line, though castles has also been played many times. And here, white has a, a pretty fundamental choice. So there's a more solid line, and then there's the really sharp line. Now the really sharp line starts with bishop to b5 check. And after bishop to d7, white pushes forward with e5. And the idea is that after knight to g4, he keeps pushing with e6. And after f takes e6, knight to g5. At first glance, this looks really pretty pretty dangerous, maybe even horrible for black. Because the threat, well, there's two threats. One is just to take the knight. And the second is to exploit the pinned bishop on d7 with knight takes e6, which hits the queen on d8. And, of course, the knight on g7. So it may look like black is in pretty serious trouble, and for many years it was thought that uh, this was just a, a really bad line for black. But 
Yasser Sirawan in 1988 figured out a way to solve this problem for black for good, at least if black doesn't mind a draw. And here's his solution. So bishop takes b5, knight takes e6, seems to just threaten everything. White's down a piece for the moment, but threatening the queen, threatening the bishop, threatening this bishop, and threatening the knight. So it looks terrific. But here's the, the brilliant solution. Bishop takes d4. And the point is that after knight takes queen, which is what happened in his game with Gyula Sachs, the strong Hungarian grandmaster, black has an immediate perpetual check. Bishop f2, king d2, bishop e3 check. And, and the players agree with a draw here. So this was a brilliant idea by Sirwan. And uh, of course, nowadays, it's also, uh, well, it's not so brilliant. It's simply a way for players who want a quick draw to avoid a, a real game. But there are ways that white can continue to play here not in that final position, but uh, a couple of things instead of taking the queen. So first of all, after bishop takes b5, the main line for players who are trying to win is knight takes b5. And there's all kinds of sharp stuff. I mean, there's a lot of theory. So I'm just introducing you to, to some of the possibilities here. White can also play queen takes g4, which looks very, very natural. But in fact, this is perhaps uh, slightly dubious. And I think, at least according to, to current theory, or theory of about a year ago when I was looking at this, uh, it seems that white has to prove equality rather than black. But again, if black knows everything. And then also, knight takes e6 is OK. And after bishop takes d4, if white wants to play a real game, he can play knight takes b5. So this is a lot of fun. And um, you know, I, I heartily recommend it to, to anyone who likes sharp positions. But Becerra avoided this, these sharp forcing lines. And, and that's, I think, a reasonable decision. I mean, the danger with, with these super sharp and super forcing lines is that while black can lose in, in 20 moves if he doesn't know everything, if he does know everything, it may just peter out to a draw. So I think Becerra, given that he's 200 points higher rated than, than Burnett, he's right to simply get a normal position with some chances for an edge and then just try to outplay his opponent. So that's what he does. He plays d takes c5. This, again, is the, the old main line here. Queen a5, bishop d3. Um, notice, of course, c takes d6 is less than great because of knight takes e4 when you've got this big pile up on, on the knight on c3. OK, so um, bishop to d3 is standard, protecting the e4 pawn sufficiently. Black plays queen takes c5, and this prevents white from castling. So for this reason, white plays queen to e2, preparing bishop to e3, and then castle. So all very logical here. Black plays bishop to g4, bishop e3, queen a5, castles, knight c6, h3, takes, takes, castles. Now I went through those moves fairly quickly, but this has all happened hundreds and hundreds of times in grandmaster play. And I'm sure thousands more times in, in master play. I mean, I've had this game, uh, this position in blitz, actually, I think, with both sides over over many years. So it's um, a very, very standard position. Now here, white's got a couple of choices. Actually, three, three moves are worth discussing here. We'll look at two of them pretty quickly. Now, the move in the game was a3. And you know, again, see the earlier idea with a3 back on move five. But the point of a3, well, it's twofold. So one, of course, is to keep the knight off of b4. And secondly, there are some positions where white should expand with b4. OK, it's not all that common, but, but it can happen. And in fact, I think there's a place in this game where that might have been even the appropriate move to make. But it's worth discussing the two other moves. So first of all, there's a real question as to whether white really should care about knight to b4. So maybe rook a to b1 is the best move. And if black plays knight to b4, no problem. We just play a3. And this, in fact, strengthens white center. So this, this exchange here helps make this guy better. And um, also, with the, uh, the symmetrical pawn structure in terms of the files, it takes away some of black's possibilities for counterplay. So here, white has a little bit of a freer hand to try to, to gain play by pushing th through, either in the center or on the king side. Maybe a, a very small advantage here. OK, so that's um, rook a to b1. Now, a move that white should avoid, though in some ways it's, it's quite natural, is knight to e2. 
Now, the reason why this is, is attractive is that it prepares the move c3, which also, by the way, takes b4 away from the, the black knight, but it also tries to blunt this bishop. So this bishop, well, let me use that color. This bishop really, of course, it's it's got this great diagonal now, but once the pawn's on c3, it comes up against this, and that really minimizes its, uh, its power. Uh, a third idea of knight to e2 is that White might like to continue with his own kingside attacking ambitions, and g4 followed by knight to g3 is one way that that might take shape. Additionally, the knight might go to d4 instead, centralizing, and there too, exerting some influence on the f5 square. So knight e2 looks very logical, but there's a tactical difficulty with it. Okay, so black plays knight to d7. And now if white continues his plan with c3, there's a problem with this. And I invite you to stop the recording here for a few moments and see if you can figure it out. It's actually, um, well, it's a fairly well-known idea. It's also one that's caught very strong players, including grandmasters. So see if you can figure it out. Okay, so uh, if you've tried and figured it out, um, great. If you haven't, here's what it is. So black plays knight d to e5, or the other knight works exactly the same way, forking the queen and the bishop, and there's no way for black, no, sorry, for white to defend the bishop on d3. So of course he can take, but after knight takes e5, black gets the bishop on the next move, assuming of course white doesn't want to give away his queen, and he ends up a perfectly good healthy pawn ahead and with a probably winning game. Okay, so knight e2 is, maybe that's okay, but if the real point is to fall with c3, that's a, it's a bad plan. All right, so anyway, Becerra played a3. This is all still theoretical, very theoretical. Knight to d7, and now I think Becerra makes, makes an error. Now, he plays the move rook a to b1, and his thought, I, I guess, would be something like, like this, that if black takes the knight, pawn takes, okay, black isn't really winning a pawn, because first of all, white has rook takes b7, so if black were to take on a3 or c3, no big deal. Also, of course, black has traded off his, his dark squared bishop, and so you might think, gee, this is going to get kind of lonely over here, white's got the bishop here, isn't this really very good for white? Well, in fact, it's not, and the reason, well, several reasons. So one is that white's queenside pawn structure is very bad, and uh, that means that if, if his attack doesn't crash through, that black is going to have excellent chances as the game goes along. Furthermore, the, the white bishop pair really isn't that useful in this position. The bishop on d3, okay, you can go to c4, but it's not going to have any help hitting the f7 pawn. The other bishop, the bishop on e3, if it goes to d4, black could swap it off. Of course, he can also play queen takes c3 here and prevent it from even getting on that diagonal in the first place. And if it goes to h, h6, well, that's not really all that exciting either. So let's think about that. Okay, so let's let's say this bishop gets to h6. Well, the only way it's going to get there, or at least reasonably, I mean, I guess you could do something like bishop to f2, to h4, to g5, to h6, which is really long-winded. So the, the more, more natural and um, more to be expected approach is by pushing the pawn to f5, but if white does that, then knight comes into e5, one, one knight or the other, I mean, either one could do it. Uh, maybe the c knight's better, so that way the other knight can go to f6 or to c5. In any event, with that knight on e5, um, it's just fantastic. So it provides more protection for the pawn on f7. So that way the rook can move from f8 without having to worry about giving up um, the f7 square. Also, it, it hits the queen, it hits the bishop on d3, so it's just fantastic. So black is really in quite good shape here. And in fact, uh, there's a game between Schmidt, Schmidt Deal, I believe, and Chernin from Dortmund in 1991. And um, Chernin won quite handily. Uh, Daniel King annotates this game in Chess Base Magazine, which if you have Mega, the, the Mega database, you'll, you'll find the notes there. And his comment about Rook A to B1, so going back here, oops, Rook A to B1, is that this is um, not an inspiring novelty. <laughs> And, um, and, he, and he adds that bishop to d2 is, of course, the normal move. And that's also what, what uh, Vigus, James Vigus, um, recommends in his book on the Peerts. So bishop to d2 instead of rook a to b1. And in fact, um, I think Vigus just says that this is necessary to avoid bishop takes c3 from black, destroying the pawn structure. 
Okay, now from here, black has two main moves, and they both seem to be good at this point. So um, one way to go is queen to b6, check, king h1, and then not taking on b2. So taking on b2 is just bad. White wins the queen. Of course, black gets a decent amount of material back for it. But this is a position where the queen proves more useful than the rook and minor piece. So white's probably clearly better here. So after king h1, black should play knight to c5. And then after rook a to b1, knight takes d3, c takes d3. Here, f5 is a good move, preventing white's kingside expansion, or at least um, doing what he can to impede it. White often plays g4 now. But anyway, this has occurred in, in a pretty pretty decent number of games, and um, black has done quite well here. So it's just an interesting position. It's occurred in a few dozen games. All right, so that's that's one way that this can go. The second approach is instead of queen to b6 check, to bring the queen all the way back to d8. And this was an idea of uh, Pierce expert uh, Alexander Chernin, who I mentioned a couple of minutes ago in the, uh, the game with bishop takes c3. Uh, he's also written a very good book on the Pirates, a few years old now, but still, I think, pretty good, um, co co-authored by Lev Albert. I think it's called Pirates Alert. Anyway, after queen of d8, this can continue king h1. Uh, there's actually a, a fair amount of theory here, so I'm just giving one very quick line. e6, f5, queen to h4, bishop f4. Now, a surprising move, bishop to e5. Again, th this shows, and this is important for black players in the periods to, to realize that while you should certainly value the stark squared bishop, uh, you shouldn't overvalue it. So black can often allow it to be exchanged without some catastrophe occurring. Okay, so um, queen e3 occurred, and then um, Vigus recommends an improvement, a6, and thinks that the position is about equal. All right, I mean, this is certainly a complicated position, and you should analyze it a good deal more before you, you rush out and play it against a very strong player. But I think I think the evaluation is, is pretty plausible here. So, um, I mean, the problem for white is that his minor pieces, especially the knight on c3 and this bishop on d3, don't have too many great options available to them. Now, this bishop can go to c4. Black might play either knight to c5 or, or rook a to e8. Um, maybe, well, maybe rook f to e8. Anyway, um, he can safeguard e6, I think, satisfactorily. And after that, it's hard to see what exactly white does, by way of immediate threats anyway. But it's certainly a very tense position. And I think one that would be a lot of fun to play, but again, I would recommend putting in some, some elbow grease before you play it. All right, well anyway, as I said, bishop to d2 is probably the best move here, but Becerra played rook a to b1, and here, um, Burnett unfortunately didn't try to punish white with bishop takes e3, but played instead bishop to d4. Okay. Um, by the way, you might have seen when in, in passing there that rook a to c8 is the third move that I, I looked at in my notes. I would just say you should probably avoid this. So bishop takes c3 is really the way to play here. All right, bishop to d4 is a novelty by Burnett. Again, showing that black doesn't really need to be too afraid of this exchange. But, but here I think white just gets a comfortable advantage. Small advantage, but but it's comfortable. So takes, takes, queen f2. Knight goes back to c6. Right, now white plays king h1. Just a useful prophylactic move, and, and it also prevents the exchange of queens from a move like queen c5 or queen to b6. Okay, so now there's no more, no more queen trade to be had. All right, black played rook a to c8. Just a good natural development, developing move. Knight to d5. And here, black played e6, which is is fine, but you know it's a little little give and take here. Of course, he doesn't want to allow this very nice knight to stay on on d5, but by playing e6, of course, he's weakening this pawn on d6 slightly. So now it's on an open file, and it's it's first of all a little bit difficult for it to advance to d5, though certainly not impossible. But if it does, then it's going to be isolated, and in a position where it's not really going to be a strong isolated pawn. All right, so white played knight to e3, which is a good move, potentially eyeing the king side, so you can see some kind of advance like this maybe taking shape in the future. But also, there's the possibility of going to c4, hitting the queen and, and exerting a little bit more pressure on the d6 pawn. 
And also, the 9 on E3 is actually pretty well placed just where it is, even um, taking it as a square in its own right as opposed to a jumping off point, because again, it helps to, to restrain the pawn on D6. All right, well here I think we have uh, a first maybe kind of key key move. So we've had some some slight inaccuracies already for both sides, but, but here maybe is, is the first kind of fairly serious um, error made by, by one of the players. And it's Burnett's choice to play f5, which is very natural. So he's, he's trying to freeze White's kingside expansion. We, we saw that again in an earlier line, um, or at least I mentioned it. I didn't actually put the move on the board. Let me see, where was that? Yes, okay, so right, it was in the bishop to d2 line, and I mentioned, okay, um, that after queen to b6, check, king h1, knight c5, rook a to b1, takes, takes, f5 occurs there. And what this does is it prevents the f5 advance, and it also tries to shut this bishop on d2 down. Okay, well, the same thing in, in the game with f5. Okay, and there's no bishop on d2, but again, it's trying to bottle up white's minor pieces and prevent the f5 advance from occurring at some later point. So it's quite logical, but the problem with it is that it's weakening some squares. So, I mean, he is weakening himself on this diagonal. Pretty obviously, the bishop can come to c4 quickly. And also, I think, you know, the e6 pawn is becoming a little bit weak, and that's, of course, a consequence of its being on that diagonal. Um, the e pawn may end up leaving, and this is, in fact, what happens. e takes f5, e takes f5. And so while the, the cowardly e pawn is now safe, the reason why I'm kind of jokingly calling it cowardly is that now this d6 pawn is all alone and it has no, no friends, no one to keep it company among his uh, fellow pawns. And so it's going to be even that much weaker. All right, well, what should black have done? Well, probably knight f6. And after, let's say, c3, which is another good natural move covering the d4 square and taking the pawn away from its slightly vulnerable spot on the uh, on the c-file. Rook c to d8, rook b to d1, a6. And um, this just looks like a, a pretty decent position for white, or uh, for black, sorry. Um, maybe white has a minuscule edge, but, but black is basically in, in decent shape. So the d-pawn really isn't such a serious problem. And if white tries to go for a kingside attack, let's say b4, uh, taking the a-pawn is very dangerous, probably just losing. So queen c7, queen h4, now knight g4, trading off one of the defenders, takes, takes. Okay, so now white's got an open h-file. But we'll see that this really doesn't amount to too much either. Okay, so h6, rook f3, rook h8, rook h3, b5, f5. All right, so this is about as scary looking as it's going to get. But it seems that black has two perfectly good ways to respond to this. So one is queen to e7, not allowing f6 check. And um, this seems to be completely fine for black. And maybe black can even play g5 and then knight to e5. So the only potential drawback is that maybe white can play f6 check at some point and, and mess up the coordination of black's rooks. But this aside, um, a lot of trumps are really on black's on black side of the board. So this knight on e5 is just fantastic. Hitting g4, blocking the e pawn, hitting the, the bishop on d3, covering c4. And speaking of c4 and the c file in general, black might really be able to exploit this at some future moment as well. So uh, another idea too for black might be something like um, queen e7, queen f6, so we covered that, then rook c8 and then doubling on the c-file. So I think black's position is actually pretty promising here. And, and maybe even one more idea, there might even be some cases where he can get away with h5 and try to show that it's not only white who might be able to use the h-file for attacking purposes. Okay, so all this to say that after Becerra's knight to e3, I think with knight to f6, Becerra is completely in the game. All right, but he played f5, and now white has a definite edge. So e takes f5, e takes f5, bishop c4 check, king h8, now bishop to e6, rook c to d8. Okay, so white certainly has an advantage here, again, thanks to, well, several factors. Black's king is a little bit airy, not too bad. I mean, it's not going to get mated soon or anything, but 
because there's the, the, the pawns in front of them have been fairly well advanced, there are chronic problems with, um, with the king's placement, as we'll see in the game. The bishop on e6 is also a very impressive looking piece, and again, black has problems too with this pawn on d6 and the d5 square. Now here Becerra makes a, a very interesting and I would say kind of surprising decision really, but uh, I think it's one that we can understand. So he plays the move bishop takes d7. You know, again, that bishop on e6 looked really magnificent. Why would you make such an exchange? I mean, it looked, the bishop looked like a, just a dagger in the heart of white's, uh, in the heart of black's position. But there are things to be said for this knight that he's taking, taking away as well. So this knight could go, for example, to c5, not right away because of b4. So remember I mentioned that that advance can happen sometimes. Um, but at some point, knight to c5 could happen, and it would be a very strong piece there, not only hitting the bishop on, on e6, but also it would have the chance to go into this beautiful e4 square. So that's uh, one pretty reasonable reason to, to get rid of it. And secondly, remember that what counts in chess isn't, or aren't the pieces that are off the board, but the pieces that are on the board. And the point that I'm trying to make is that after this exchange, white still maintains a, a pretty nice stable advantage. The pawn on d6 is still isolated and slightly weak. The, the square on d5 is still a potential asset for, for white if he can manage to maintain control over it. So while white is maybe trading off one sort of advantage, he's also preventing a good deal of black counterplay. I mean, this knight on c6, it's, it's, it would take it four moves to get to, um, to e4 under ideal circumstances. And, um, you know, so it'd have to play like knight e7, knight to g8, knight f6, knight e4. So that's, that's a pretty long journey. And well before that happens, white will have made some very um, useful moves that'll, that'll trump that. Okay, so to the game, white plays a very logical move, he plays c4. So again, trying to cement his control over the, B5, uh, the d5 square. Here, um, Burnett played b5, which is quite logical, and we hopefully all understand exactly why he did that. He's fighting for the d5 square. But there was an interesting option. He could have tried rook to e7, simply, well, not necessarily jettisoning the, the d6 pawn, but, but giving up the fight for, let's say, the d5 square, certainly, and going for counterplay. So after knight to d5, plays rook to e4, and he's going to double rooks on the e-file. So he has to be careful. It doesn't want to allow knight to f6, of course. Illustrate that. Okay, so certainly don't want to allow that. But at some point, the doubling might be good. And in fact, even there, it's not necessarily so bad because of rook to e2. So let me get rid of all the arrows here. Um, so that's one idea. A second idea is to put the knight on d4. A third might be to play queen c5, swap queens, and because the rooks are so powerful, to, to simply be able to hold the end game. And show that also this f4 pawn may be slightly weak too. OK, so rook f to d1. Now here black has a choice. Taking the pawn fails because of a neat little tactic. And this is, I think, a useful reminder that Black's king, Black's king, again, has chronic problems. So b3, rook e4, queen b2 check, a little bit of uh-oh here, king g8, and then knight f6 check wins the exchange. Black has a pawn for it, but it's not a very impressive pawn, and his king is still in some, some danger, so white's clearly better here. Okay, instead of rook takes c4, queen c5 I think is better, centralizing the queen again. But all the same, white's position is, is better. I mean, his knight on d5 is better than black's knight on d4, which is quite unstable. I mean, white's threatening, among other things, to play b4. So b5 answers that, because now b4 can be met by queen takes c4. But there's still other problems for black. So rook to d2, say he takes. Well, yeah, it kind of has to take, because uh, rook b to d1 is a big threat regardless. So queen takes c4, rook b to d1 anyway. And now queen takes c3 is, of course, no use, because knight takes c3, and white's hitting both the knight and the rook. So queen takes d5, rook d4, takes, takes. Now, black can get out of the worst of the discovered checks with queen f7, but still, 
In this position, Y is clearly better here. Um, black's queenside pawns are a little bit weak. The white queen on the long diagonal is super strong, and uh, and white's rook is also very good too. So this is um, this is a tough position for for black to hold here. Certainly, white is is very much in charge. All right, but still, I mean, this is a long line, and you know, I'm sure that Becerra didn't calculate all of that. Fairly sure. And, um, you know, I just think there are some decent chances. It's a reasonable line to consider for black with rook to e7. But anyway, b5 is also quite reasonable, too. Okay, white played rook f to d1. Again, trying to do everything he can to, to maintain control over d5. Okay, now, black shouldn't take on c4. This would be a mistake, because knight c4. And now, um, if he plays queen to c7, this is just bad, because of rook b to c1. And then here, d5 would just lose, so... Um, I'll just show you quickly. And now there are many ways for white to win. This is the simplest. Check. Check again. And goodbye rook on c6. So instead of encouraging rook b to c1, blacks just play queen to d8. But now rook to d5. So we've locked the pawn in place. We're ready to, to double here, maybe even triple if need be. And if black tries to play knight e7, well, does play knight e7, trying to evict the rook. Queen d4 check, and then rook takes pawn. Gives white an extra pawn and a winning advantage. Okay, so instead of b takes c4, black played b4. Rook to d5, queen a4. Now a very nice move by Becerra. He plays queen to d2. He's not worrying about the, uh, the a pawn at all. b a. Now here actually, he should have taken back and then on queen a3, c5 would have given him a, a big advantage. So he played queen c3 check. I mean, he's still definitely better. Just black is doing a little bit better than he would have been. Okay, so b a, rook d b5. It's a nice, very nice move, actually. I, I like this move a lot. So he's taking over the b file, which he may use, and he's clearing the d5 square for the knight. And you can see that, of course, knight f6 check could prove quite uh, painful for black. Okay, so knight e7 is reasonable. It stops the knight going to d5, but now we've got further penetration here with rook to b8. Okay, rook c8, queen f6. All right, so now, I mean, white is really, he's just cooking here. Black is in terrible trouble. I mean, there's the threat of queen e6 check for one thing. Um, you know, he's vulnerable here with this, this rook on c8. There's the queen e6 idea. Maybe there's going to be knight to d5 in some positions. So he's black is pretty well bound hand and foot here. So he plays queen to c6. And now see if you can find a winning move. So here, it's, it's a little bit tough. Uh, obviously, it's tough. Becerra didn't find it. But give it a try. So stop the recording. Take a couple minutes. Maybe take five minutes. And, and see if you can you can work out the win. I'd say maybe two or three minutes. Anyway, have, have at it. OK. Now the move played in the game was queen the e6 check, but this was not the the winning move. Now this isn't a bad move. I mean, he keeps a, a significant advantage after this. But c5 is a very nice shot that pretty much wins on the spot, and it really just um, shows that that black is just terribly overloaded here. Okay, so first of all, he can't take the pawn because if he plays queen takes c5, queen e6 check, goodbye rook. So that's no good. If black plays d takes c5, well, this is just as bad. Queen takes c6. The rook can't recapture because, of course, it's illegal. And after knight takes c6, rook c8 is winning all kinds of material. So he's already won a rook, and he's going to win a piece too, because knight to d8, rook b to b8 wins the knight. OK, so this is all completely unacceptable. Well, how about a move like queen to c7, just getting out of the way? Well, now white plays with this. Not the only winning move, but simple enough. And um, here all of black's options are terrible. If he plays queen to d8, well, there's that check again, and the rook on d7 falls. Just trade those off and take. So after rook one to b7, black just has to give up the queen here for the rooks. But it turns out that he's losing more stuff. So c takes d6. And if the knight moves, then there's queen to e6, check and winning the rook. So rook c1 is fairly forced. But now, knight to d5, and the threat of knight to e7 is um, not really, can't really stop it in any any sensible way. So white's, white's winning more material here, 
and enjoys a winning position. Uh, maybe I can try rook to, to e1. Let me see. I think probably just d7. Yeah, that looks like that should win. Because the difference now, I mean, before when the rook was on c1, that wasn't a threat. But now that it's not there, that's the point. So white's just winning here. All right, so c5, the point then is that this was just an immediate killer. So after queen e6 check, now it's, it turns into work again. So king g7, takes and takes. Uh, here white should just play rook to d1. I mean, he puts the rook on the d file in a couple of moves, but there doesn't seem to be anything that he gained, and maybe he even lost a little something out of it. So he played rook to b3. Here, um, Burnett maybe should have played queen to c7. Slightly better square, but okay, he plays queen to d8, rook to d3. And now black is in pretty serious trouble again. So with queen to c7, he would have had um, a better chance, but now, now he's got some troubles. So the threat is, well, let me see, might be threatening c5. Probably is threatening c5 here. And uh, that's what would happen if you played knight c8, for, certainly in this case. So knight c8, c5 would be um, very much better for white. But he played knight to g8. And this looks kind of reasonable. And the funny thing is, it looks like it's helping to defend the king. But in fact, it, it falls prey to a, a tactical problem. So again, good place to stop the recording and see if you can figure out what white played here. And it was the right move this time. Okay, so here it is. I'm going to assume you already tried. The move is knight takes f5. So very nice move by, by Bracera. If um, black doesn't take, well, then white's just delighted. He'll take on d6, two extra pawns, and a big attack. So he's got to take rook to g3 check. King h8 is forced. And now rook g8. So he wins a pawn. And after queen takes c4, he's got a choice between taking on d6 or f5. They're both, I think, about equally good. Um, he chose to take the pawn in f5. So they're both all right, though. OK, well, now it's a good time to take stock, because obviously we've left the middle game behind, um, left all of the attacking ideas behind here. Well, OK, queen f8 is a, is a real threat. But um, generally speaking, there's no real attacks going on. Now it counts, of course, with the past pawn. So white's got past f pawn, black's got a past d pawn, and what the two are going to try to do is to, to find ways to get their own um, pawn pushed while preventing the other one. Now that's, again, really painfully obvious. The way this is going to work, though, is by trying to use counterpins. So we'll actually see some of this in, in the lines to come. The other thing, of course, the white has to be aware of is perpetual check. Black, of course, doesn't mind being perpetual since he's a pawn down and um, is definitely worse. All right, well, anyway, here white is threatening queen f8, as I said, which wins a second pawn. So black plays king to g8, perfectly reasonable move. King h2, getting out of the way. d5, queen e6. Now, this illustrates what I meant by the, these pin ideas. So with the queen on, e, on e6, the d pawn can't advance because the queen would hang. So both players are going to, and ought to, use this kind of trick. To, uh, to help defend. All right, the problem though is that after king to f8, um, white would like to play f5, but after queen to f4, there are going to be lots and lots of checks. So maybe maybe this is perfectly OK. I mean, there often does come a moment in a queen ending where the stronger side's king does have to go, go out into the open and go journeying around because um, the, the queen, the strong side's queen, is unable to both advance the pawn and simultaneously cover all of the uh, defender's checking possibilities. But at least for the moment, Becerra wants to avoid this and just plays the, the centralizing queen to e5, which is actually a very good move, though perhaps he didn't follow it up in the best way. Uh, I, I should say, as a, a useful general, general rule, that in queen ending, centralization is extremely important, uh, just for a number of reasons. So one is, of course, that uh, it happens here to cover this important diagonal. So by covering this diagonal, of course, that takes away any meaningful black check at all. But by having the queen well centralized, of course, you're going to have better access to your own pawns and to threatening the opponents. So white is threatening to play both queen to h8 check and queen takes h7 check, or 
kind of uh, so neat parallel, queen to b8 check followed by queen takes a7. So um, very good position for, for white. Okay, Sarah just decided, uh, sorry, Burnett decided to just get on with it. He can't really defend against those threats in, in a useful way. So he plays d4, just wants to get his own pawn rolling as fast as he can. Now, Becerra decided that um, he would follow Burnett's example with f5, pushing his pawn too. But it looks like he should have played queen h8 check. And the point is that he can actually take the pawn and then restore the same situation and then play f5. So queen h8, queen h7, queen f5. Um, if Burnett had gone to the e file, let's say queen to, or king to e8, well, then queen to e4 check, and then he can just play f5. So he'll even have a, a nifty little pin. Or he could play again, look for some way to get the queen to, to uh, e5 again. Maybe that'll happen, then f5. All right, at any rate, let's say king to f8, queen f5, king g7, queen e5, and there you are. So you're back on the same square. And now f5 is possible, or again, queen to e4 with this um, nasty little pin idea is also quite, quite good. Okay, uh, actually let me show you this line because it has a very pretty uh, idea in it. So this is a really neat idea and one that I think is worth remembering. So it doesn't actually, I'm trying to remember if it shows up in the game. Maybe there's one place where Becerra does, um, does have it in mind or something similar. But anyway, I'll, I'll stop uh, alluding and, and just show you. So d3, this looks like the obvious way for black to continue. And now a really fantastic idea. This is really nice. G4. All right. Now, what makes it nice isn't that it's um, exposing the white king somewhat, because the king will pretty easily escape checks going like this. The reason why this is really nice is that he seems to be doing absolutely nothing about black's threat to advance his own pawn. So D2. And now, continuing in the same vein, f6. So very nice. And the point is that if black queen's here, white checks, and then no matter where the black king goes, he's mated. So beautiful idea. The pawn on f6 supports the queen. And the pawn on g4, of course, cuts off the uh, black king's possible flight squares on f5 and h5. So very nice idea. And likewise, if king to g6 here, going back, now queen to f5, queen d7, and queen takes d2. And this is just a, a very easy win. So even though the white king is a little bit exposed, with two extra pawns, it's really not going to be a problem. It just requires a modicum of caution, but it's, uh, it's not too difficult to win this. All right, so we go back to the position after d4. So as I was saying, queen h8 check is possible. White could have gotten away with it. All right, instead he played f5. Now here, black should have played king to f7, making white's life a little bit more difficult. And if we try to get into a variation that's similar, let's say f6, uh, d3, here, black could actually maybe play queen to e6 if white tried g4. And in this line, okay, if he tries g4, black can do this. And um, on the trade of queens, black is actually okay. And if queen e4, okay, white remains a pawn up, but it's only a pawn up now, so black actually has decent drawing chances here. All right, another line, if queen of g7 check, and now f7, then we have this. Okay, so it's going to be perpetual, because if g3, queen c2, and we just keep checking on the back two ranks, while if king of g1, again, um, queen to c1 is... Uh, perpetual. So white has to play queen g3, but now queen f7, and again, it's just a pawn. Black has some chances. All right, so after f5, black played, instead of king f7, he played d3. Okay, and now it's kind of similar to what we saw before. So white first gets his queen on as good as possible a square before he takes further action. Now here, he should have played queen e7 check, and now this g4 idea yet again. If d2, f6 is winning, again, there's no perpetual because the white king will escape out this way. Okay, so black can stop the mate, 
like this, but again, we get the uh, two pawn up ending with an easy win. Actually, maybe it's going to be three pawns up now. Anyway, um, so that would have been what should happen if white played queen e7. Say he played king to g3. And here, Burnett missed his last really good chance of the game. Queen e4. Now, this is a really good move. And remember what I said about centralization. Works beautifully for black, too, not just for white. Now, the point is that, first of all, we're taking away e6. Well, actually, e6 was already covered, so that's not a new point, but it maintains control over e6. But the more important point is that it's also preventing the idea of queen g6 followed by f6 because the queen simply hangs. So it's difficult for white to um, promote his, or for him to advance the pawn safely. I mean, he can play f6 check, but after king to g6, black has maybe no problems at all there, or at least comparatively few problems. Okay, well, after missing queen to e4, playing queen to c3, now everything's fine. But it's still, it takes a very nice finish from Becerra to win this in the most effective manner possible. So he starts with queen to e7 check, and now Burnett plays king to h6, trying to keep his king off the back rank and away from immediate mating problems. All right, well here, I think we have maybe our, our last really neat chance to try to play like Becerra. So again, stop the recording and see if you can work this, this position out pretty much to the finish, or pretty close to the finish. Okay, so assuming you've tried to do this, let's see how the game concluded here. Now, black seems to be threatening d2 check, followed by d1 queen. Well, it doesn't seem to be. He is threatening it. The question is just how serious this threat really is. Is it one that white needs to drop everything to meet, or can he create some threats of his own? And the answer is that he can indeed create his own threats with f6. All right, let's see how this works. Well, d2 check, king to h2, and now if Burnett queens, queen to g7 check, g4 check, and despite the two queens, black's king is helpless. Uh, either he gets mated or he ends up losing both queens, well, by a trade. So um, king h4, queen h6 is easy. That's mate. So queen takes g4. And now the best way for white to, to finish, I think, or at least the simplest way, the most human way, is queen g4, queen h4, queen g3, and the queens come off the board. And the resulting end game, the resulting king and pawn ending is a trivial win for white. OK, so d1 queen is losing. So Burnett played king to g6, which was the best try. Becerra pushes his f-pawn. And now black's best is probably to play queen c8. Now this loses, but everything's losing. And this at least is the best chance. So white can either queen or be, uh, be funny and, and make a knight. It comes to the same thing. Black should take, promote his pawn. And of course, white should win this. He's got two extra pawns. But still, at least a modicum of caution is required. And, um, and since they were probably, I think, um, down to their last time control too, just maybe playing off of the increments at this point. You never know. So I'm in time trouble, especially when it's permanent time trouble. Accidents can happen. You could get lucky. So white should win this. But still, if black is going to resist at all, this is the only way to do it. Okay. Instead,